are areas where AI is already better than the human experts are. So we have some kinds of uh, uh, X-ray uh, images with certain types of cancer or uh, skin lesions, uh, birthmark changes, where AI is better at uh, distinguishing malignant from benign uh, changes than human experts are. I saw the man on the hill with a telescope, but if we think about it a bit more, we see that it can be interpreted in well, at least five different ways. Uh, base. We've seen the man, I saw the man. But what did I see? Was the man on the hill and I was using the telescope? Or was the man using the telescope? Or was the hill uh, with the telescope? Etc. You get my point. And uh, this kind of ambiguity is rule more often than exception when it comes to natural language. Natural language is also implicit. The reason is uh, that uh, human capacity, and especially specialist human capacity like medical expertise, are limited. The demand for healthcare is much bigger than supply. We've noticed that the uh, when doctors are speaking about abdominal pain, the patients are speaking about stomach ache. And this is something that system could learn much more efficiently and adapt than, indivi than individual human doctors could. AI is not only improving efficiency and quality of healthcare and uh, decreasing costs. I think the prognosis is that in the US, uh, uh, cost, healthcare costs will be reduced by a couple of billion of dollars by 2020, uh, thanks to AI. In the future, I am convinced, convinced that we will see even more synergy of different kinds of data sources and different kinds of AI. So you've probably seen these types of loss curves and that kind of thing. What you're really seeing is a, a mapping of a super high dimensional thing onto one dimension. I like to think of it as a spaceship going through a landscape with potholes. You guys might have had the situation where you're training a, a complicated model like uh, AlexNet or, or ResNet or something even more complicated and it's gone to a certain accuracy and then it sort of stops for a while. And then it goes down and then it stops. And then it goes down and then it's, here you actually see it, those little zigzag patterns at the bottom. It's that landscape that's actually going through with a little spaceship. The, the subspace that you cut through to see this particular landscape is arbitrary. And you know, if you imagine the 2D loss, that is a subspace of this. So you know, you're cutting this in some arbitrary direction and looking at the lost landscape, and this is what it looks like, and it's even more perilous for our poor little Millennium Falcon in higher dimensions. Uh, but at least this is a neat way of thinking about it and why perhaps momentum, <clears throat> imagine here, these are the skip connections that uh, residual networks have. If you start off your, um, your uh, learning with a certain momentum and no uh, decay, you could end up in a nice little orbit here, and it's just gonna stay there and spin for a long time. You're like, why isn't it learning anything? This is why. Thinking in analogies is what will unlock these cool architectures and help you solve cool problems. Maybe, you know, in, in natural language, like with Winograd sentences, where it needs to understand what, what stuff is in the world, you need to combine NLP with other stuff, and how should that combination look like, and what should the memory that it has look like, and, you don't necessarily have to be a math expert, but if you can think in terms of analogies, you'll be able to do it.